sun you loved and made me in the glory of your grace you bought and gave me this life eternally oh this life so rich and free but God but the love what a father for God what a love what a father what a God what a love what a father the beauty of your holiness oh Lord I praise you oh, the beauty of your holiness I worship Uh 
So desirous of bearing the image of your son, walking in the glory of the Holy One. Lord, we're so hungry, so thirsty for you now. Showers of blessings poured out. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 I will love you. I will serve you because you loved me. Lord, you have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your love. Is what I always long for. You have given life to me. Lord, I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was not. Before you found me, you have given life to me. Oh, heartaches and broken pieces, 
ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your love touch is what I've longed for. Your touch you have given life to me. Now that you know it, we'll sing. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing before you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches and broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch is what I always long for. You have given life to me. Oh, Lord, you're wonderful beyond all description. Lord, you're wonderful beyond all compare. Lord, you're wonderful beyond all I could ever think or ask. You have given. Lord, you're wonderful beyond all description. Oh, Lord, you're wonderful. Kisoria, beyond all compare. Oh, Lord, you're wonderful beyond all that I could ever think or ask. You have given. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, you're wonderful beyond all description. Lord, you're wonderful beyond all compare. Oh, Lord, you're wonderful beyond all I could ever think or ask. You have given life to me. Yes, why in the mind today? Lord, you're wonderful beyond all description. Our Lord, you're wonderful and beyond all compare. <laughs> oh, Lord, you're wonderful beyond all I could ever think or ask. You have given life. This is for real. I will serve you because I love you. You have given life to me. I was nothing until you found me. You have given life to me. Heartaches, oh, broken pieces, ruined lives are why you died on Calvary. Your touch is what I'm longed for. You have given. Pretty fair description. In 
Holy Ghost, I yield myself to you. Let your rivers flow out of me. Oh, Holy Ghost, I yield myself to you. Let your rivers flow out of me. Holy Ghost. Oh, Holy Ghost, I yield myself to you. Let your rivers flow out of me. Oh, for you are all I see. In my heart belongs to you. In hope. Let your rivers flow out of me. Oh, Holy Ghost, I yield myself to you. Let your rivers flow out of me. Oh, for you are all I see. My heart belongs.
you are and what you've done, what you'll do, God, for those who will walk with you. Oh, Lord, your hands have formed me and your spirit gave me life. You filled me with your love. Oh, you paid such a great, great price to bring me to this place of loving and knowing you. God, I'll walk with you. are all I see. My heart belongs to you. Holy Spirit, come for fresh on me. For you're all I seek. My heart belongs to you. Holy Spirit, come and flow. For you are all I see. Hallelujah. <laughs> My heart belongs to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come and flow like rivers to me. I yield to you. I yield to you. I yield, to you. I yield myself to you, oh. finds all life, oh God, that your rivers flow. For you are all I see, Jesus.
your people that you redeemed. I let your rivers flow. I let your rivers flow. I let your rivers flow through me. This is why your hands have formed me. Your spirit gave me life. You filled me with your love. You opened up my eyes. What a glorious God. I'll let your rivers flow. Your anointing. Your power God in me. <laughs> I'll let your rivers flow. Your anointing. Your power, oh God. Flowing out of me. This life of oh, the Father. I'll let your rivers flow. Jesus. 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 to be served, worthy to be praised, worthy to be honored, loved and obeyed. Jesus, 
Jesus, worthy to be served, worthy to be loved, worthy to be honored and obeyed. Jesus. Yes, oh my. everything see for me when I say that name every power of the enemy is broken and removed sickness disease sin and poverty temptations overthrown hallelujah What a mighty, mighty, mighty name. Worthy to be served. Worthy to be loved. Worthy to be honored and obeyed. Worthy to be served. Worthy to be loved. Worthy to be honored and obeyed. Ah, worthy to be served, worthy to be loved, worthy to be honored. Ah, worthy to be served, worthy to be loved, worthy to be honored and obeyed. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to church. We are truly so happy that you are here seeking God with us today. You can be seated. Worthy to be loved. Worthy to be honored and obeyed. Oh, worthy to be served. Worthy to be loved. Worthy to be honored and obeyed. Oh, worthy to be served. Oh, worthy to be loved. Worthy to be honored and obeyed. He gave up everything for you and me. He gave up everything to set us free. Free to worship Him. Free to walk and know Him. Free to reign eternally. He's worthy to be served. Worthy to be loved. Worthy to be honored and obeyed. It does not feel right to stop that worship. <laughs> Jesus, <you're> so wonderful. <laughs> I just want to ask a couple things of you guys and one is just silence your cell phones we don't want to be a distraction to what's going on this morning and if you have to exit for any reason please don't slam the doors <laughs> just, just a couple housekeeping notes please let's participate in what God's doing Ooh. on Tuesday we have young married group for all the married couples that want to be a part of that. That is led by Pastors Joshua and Allie at their home. <laughs> that is from 7 to 9 p.m. Again, that's this Tuesday, the 28th of February. And we have our women's meeting this Wednesday. Woohoo! That's led by Pastor Geneva. <laughs> that is at 10.30 a.m. at Mary's house. 
And Thursday, we have Abiding Youth. That is at 6 p.m. If you need a ride, we can make sure that you have one. We don't want anybody to have to miss that because of where it is or for whatever reason. Please see us. We'll make sure you have uh, the ability to get there so you can be a part of youth. We have our youth camp coming up. We're so excited for that. That's going to be June 19th through the 23rd. Woohoo! Yeah! Make sure you get deposits in so that your spot is saved. The deposits are due March 13th. That's coming up quickly. Let's just get what needs to be done done. We have Doug Rowland here. Oops, I don't want to miss the Bible study. Thank you. Go back to that slide, please. Bible study. For those of you that are just reading the Bible for the first time, this is the perfect opportunity to join Dr. Graham in teaching. That is at 6.30 on Thursday, and that will be at David's house. And then coming up, we have Doug Rowland. He will be here Saturday and Sunday. That's March 4th and 5th. And then we have Joe and Becky the following week on Sunday, March 12th. Joe and Becky Cruz. We can't wait to have them. (laughs) And then we have James Levesque. He will be here Saturday and Sunday. That's March 18th and 19th. That's everything for you for this week and upcoming this month. I'll give you any more information once I have it. I love you guys. So there's absolutely no excuse, you know, not to bring people to the meeting because I'm not preaching. All these other guys who are so much nicer and, and more anointed than I am going to be here. And so I just encourage you, invite people, have them come. You know, I I think one of the things that that people really need to come to understand is, you know, being in these meetings where the Spirit of the Lord is moving and consecration of your life is is your response and vows are being made to walk with God and serve God. And, you know, the principalities and the powers of wickedness hear all of this thing. And Satan sits in his realm and laughs at you. Because he really believes that he owns you. He believes that he can prove that he owns you over and again. And ultimately, that doesn't look very good um, at the end of your life and at the end of all things. Because God's judgment is true and he's never going to turn back on his judgments. It doesn't matter if the whole world turns to Satan. Paul's not going to change his judgments. People think that, oh, somehow God's going to be a soft touch. And because of his love and compassion, he's going to like, okay, well, I'm going to mitigate this thing. Because I, I don't want everybody basically ending up in the same damnation that Satan has def- already been, you know, judged. And, and that judgment has already been executed. But I'm going to tell you right now, Father is so dedicated to his ways. Though none goes with him, still he'll go his way. Still he'll follow holiness. He'll follow those things which he's exalted above his name. You know, I believe there's, there's three things in dealing with temptation. Temptation is Satan mocking you and trying to prove that he owns you. Temptation is the means by which God allows us to be sorted out and wants to strengthen us so that we naturally obey. So that we natu- our natural response is just to obey God and walk with God and do what's right, no matter what, what's up, no matter what we're up against or what we're challenged with. And there's three elements to really dealing with temptation. One of them should be clearly a fear of the eternal judgment. You know, I don't think that that should be the top one, but I, I really, I'm going to tell you right now, that it would be, it's right to be, have a fear of eternal judgments. Another one is just wisdom to recognize you sin and it's going to work out good. It's always, it, you know, it's just a law. It's like gravity. You're never going to defy, de- deny it. I mean, look, the stats are in, the data is there, 100%, not 99.9, 100%. Sin is going to result in devastation. It's going to result in some kind of death and some kind of destruction. 100%. There is absolutely no reason for anybody to say it's not so because they're arguing from just absolute ignorance. When something is 100%, it's absolute. In science, we only talk about 99% or 99.9%. But this is 100%. 100% of the data is in. Everybody who sins, it results in despair, destruction, torment in their life. So number one thing, once again, in dealing with temptation, you should be afraid or fear, fear of the eternal judgment. Yeah. 
Because God's judging. God has judged sin already in the past. And he's not going to go back and repent to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's not going to go back and repent to those people in the days of Noah. Because that was an act of God's mercy to bring it all to an end. So there would be a remnant of those things which he created in his image and his likeness. He only had Noah and his family. All the rest of the world. I know. Look at the stats. Look at the statistics on that. People want, people fall under this influence of serving their bodies. Of serving their own interest. I mean, I tell you right now, your life is far more than the clothes you wear. Your life is far more than the food you eat. Your life is far more than the sensations and the pleasures of your body and the things that are imposed upon you within the culture and society of this world. Or really, as the scripture says, it doesn't really say world, cosmos. It uses the word eon, which is age. And uh, it's the age. It's the spirit of the age. We live in an age now that is saturated by the things of the powers of darkness and, and what they're supposed to be is there's supposed to be a mighty force and saturation also of the Spirit of God like the water that covers the sea. But God's people aren't really cooperating with them much. Because the only way that there could be such a force, a spiritual force, is when God's people are allowing the Holy Spirit to have his way with their life. And then it grows into a place of just an effulgency of his presence with rivers flowing out of every one of us. The only way that you could really understand that is to look back at as what people call a sovereign moves of God in history, like the awakenings that have taken place and revivals that have taken place. Moves of God that has taken place, like in wealth. In wealth. Uh, in Wales, uh, 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 the, in the UK in, in 1904, you know, there was always these waves of, of the move of God among the Welsh. But like every 30, 40 years, it was an amazing what would happen. But it kind of culminated in 1904. And the impact of it was so great that the UK shook under the power, the, what we call the United Kingdom, shook under the power of the Holy Spirit for over six months. There, that, that light. See, God made us to be the light of the world, but I mean, there, there's a, it's kind of like, it's not the effulgency of the light that Jesus showed, that the Apostle Paul showed. And what happens is we say within our hearts, and when we're coming in these meetings, we're seeking God, you're in meetings every night. I promise you, if you were in meetings every night for a month, your life would be radically impacted. And I promise you, you would deal with Satan mocking you and saying, I own you, shut up. And then where you could actually hear that, I'm going to tell you right now, you're like, okay, well, now, <laughs> now you're in the throes of the thing. You're not owning me here, okay? But as long as he kind of leaves it in silence and just plays you on desires that if you, if you, if you respond to is going to, is going to work death and destruction. This is just all there is to it. Uh, you know, and if you got that wisdom, if you just have that wisdom, I'm telling you right now, that is going to take you forward. I promise you, you stay, some, every one of you in this place that have ever had an experience with God, you know your happiest moments has been when you've been overwhelmed by His presence. Amen. The happiest moments when you knew that you were right with God, there was nothing between you and God, and the Holy Spirit had just free course to flow through you. Because a whole lot about the Holy Spirit being ha- able to freely f- flow through us is our conscience and our thoughts being washed and cleansed by the blood. To where we don't feel like, oh, you know, I, I, there's no way you can like me or love me. I mean, I've just totally been a bad boy or a bad girl. I just, you know, I'm not done it right. I mean, I've just totally blown it. I mean, you know, those kind of things. Holy Spirit can't flow through that because he flows to a realm of faith and salvation. He throws a realm of, flows to a realm of faith in the blood of Jesus Christ that washes you and cleanses you. He flows to a realm of being a new creation where you don't have a conscience that says that you're a sinner and separated from God. This, he flows in the realm of faith. We have access unto him by the faith of Jesus Christ, okay? We have access unto the Father by, by the Holy Spirit. Those two things are absolutely uh, worded almost exactly the same with just the, the, the substitution of access by faith through Jesus Christ by the faith of him, Jesus Christ, or access by the Spirit of God. And so the third thing, which should be the top and foremost thing, but it really isn't. Because, I mean, it is to some degree, but it really isn't to the degree that it needs to be. And Father is good, okay with it, as it were. He continues to show forth his mercy towards us until we get it. Are you with me? And that is, we should obey him because we love him. 
And, you know, <laughs> it, it, we, I, it would be wonderful, you know, if we were, if we, you know, we were singing this song, I will serve you because I love you, you have given life to me. You know, because that's all true, and we all know that, and when we sing it, we're like, yeah, that's, that's the way my life was. It was heartaches, broken pieces. I mean, I don't like to say just broken people, because I'm bringing it to you. I'm bringing it home. People just want to, they always want to try to tie me down to the words somebody else did. I'm just improving it for myself, okay? I'm just modifying it so it's more meaningful. Yes, broken people, but broken pieces in our own individual lives. And, and that's what the Lord did. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to come and bind up the broken pieces of the heart. This is a, <laughs> this is a good, Hallie, this is the goodness of God. I mean, we really want it to come to the place where truly we're just saying no to Satan, having authority over him. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now. The powers of darkness are going to do everything that they possibly can do to keep you from knowing this intimacy, this realm, this kind of obedience. Because in this place of of receiving what God has, walking with God. He's absolutely destroyed. It's his, his atmosphere is not the dominating force in a world around us. His, the atmosphere uh, of a prison is very different from the atmosphere of this room here today. Are you listening to me? Because, yes. you know, there may be a few people going to church, but, you know, it's just kind of like an, an imprisoned church service. And I don't mean to say anything negative about your church meeting in the prison today. I'm just telling you. It is a different atmosphere where the world in, as a whole has some uh, really that same kind of an atmosphere. And the only thing that challenges that is when there's a people moving in the presence and the power of God. Now what happens is if someone walks in here from outside, they're going to be, they're going to be challenged by it. They're going to be affected by it to some degree. But when that grows bigger and that there is more participation in it. And really, it doesn't necessarily need to be so many people because we've watched just one person move in such a power of God and they became such a force. One person is stronger than, I'm going to say, two billion in the powers of darkness. One person has more authority and more influence by the power of the Holy Ghost. Just God is so much bigger. Really, it's one, one against, uh, you know, I'd say 700 trillion, just to put it way up there, okay? Because Father's, the magnitude of Father's influence and love and goodness manifested is so much more profoundly impactive in people's lives than Satan's hate and darkness. And so we want to we understand that. We want to get there. We want to realize that when we're talking about obedience to God, on whatever level, saying no to the influences of darkness and saying no to the influences of sin and iniquity, we're saying yes to holiness. We're saying yes to participating with his presence. Now, I, I want you to understand, you could be a person, I'd like say a Buddhist, a Hindu, a, 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 a Haradim, Jewish Orthodox person, and you could have no sin in your life in any way in an outward form, but you're still not going to be able to interact with his holiness because the access that we have into his holiness is only by the blood of Jesus. But now having that access, we should have a greater intensity about walking out this obedience to God than the Haradim or the Hindus or the Buddhists or whatever who have no access to his presence. Why? Because there's no access but by the blood of Jesus Christ. Men can never pay for their sin. You can never pay for your wrongdoing. I'm going to tell you right now, if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, there's absolutely no way that I would ever make heaven. Somebody said, oh, well, you've just done this, and you've done that. No, if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, all the sin and the iniquity and the trespasses of my life, which have been great, would absolutely hang upon my life, and I would have to rightly give an account for that and pay the penalty. Well, what God did in his love and mercy for us is he sent his only begotten son who took my, personally took my sins and my iniquity. He never did anything wrong. He never disobeyed. He never should have ever had to suffer the consequence of my sin and my shame and my wrongdoing. It should have never had to be laid upon his pure and tender and holy soul. But he did, was willing to take it. And yours too. Yes. Yours may not be so bad. Mine was really bad. And I really believe that anybody who's ever really been anywhere near the Lord, it doesn't. My mother gave her life to the Lord at 10 years old. She was a rank sinner. You know? She, you know, she, she, all of a sudden, the disobedience and the sneaking around that she did, and I don't know what, she stole the cookie from the cookie jar. I don't know what it was. 
but in, when you really, in, when you really begin to stand in His presence, no matter who you are, suddenly the contrast, if you've lived pure and perfect in every way, the contrast is still you're undone. I mean, you look at, you look, I don't care whether you're looking at, at Job, who God himself says is righteous and upright, and he's the only man, well, there's one of three men, he's one of three men that he said that about. The Lord did never say that about me before I was born again. <laughs> He never said that about me. He said it about Job. But yet Job in his encounter with God said, you know, I, I'm, I'm undone in, the, in similar ways to where that Isaiah was saying, I, I'm undone. And you think about the, the holiness and the anointing upon Isaiah. He was of the priesthood, you know. And I understand the kind of, of sacredness and holiness that they were that they lived in from birth. They they really had by and large nothing set before them or nothing in their life, no relatives, no friends, no associates, that had anything to do with the spirit of the age. They were all consecrated to the word of God, to the ways of God. The pictures they would have seen, they wouldn't have had any. Uh, you know, would have still been just something reflecting God's goodness and God's glory. Everything about their life from the time they woke up in the morning until the time that they went to bed was just purity. In that culture, most literally, honestly, if I got graphic with it, most of those kids knew nothing about their physiology from a perspective of sexuality until they were actually being getting married that day. And then the rabbi came and helped to explain, you know, the physiology of their life. But yet we live in this corrupt, perverse, intensely iniquitous world that is so opposed to God. We are literally saturated with things that really, it's almost like living in hell. And we've, oh, we've bought into a society like this. We actually participate with this society. We give them our money. We give them our time. We give them our service because they give us our food. But, and, but I'm saying... They don't do that for me, and I pray they don't do that for you. And, and reality of it is the church, if the church, the church is huge. If there was solidarity among the church and all of the church was saying, I'm going to give myself to the ways of God. We're going to give ourselves to a culture within a culture. Are you with me? We're going to give ourselves to the culture of God. The Jews actually do it. And that's why up in Williamsburg, New York. And that's why they're trying in New York to make laws to where that they can tear down um, that segregation that the Jew, Jewish people, the, the, uh, which is a Hasidim for, for the most part, uh, have. They're trying to. But it just, you know. The, the Jew, Jewish people are really smart. They got the best lawyers. And so, <laughs> and, and many, of the, many of the judges that sit on uh, the different uh, uh, circuits there in New York are also Jewish. And so they are going to, they're going to support this consecration. Amen. And this is a place of a, a unique lifestyle. And no matter what anybody says or what they throw at them, in the midst of all of this iniquity and all of this, you know, uh, wokeism and canceling people and all the rest of the things, there are going to be certain segments of our society that are not going to participate with the ever-increasing wickedness. And so I want to just talk about you for a minute. And I want to talk about me. Uh, for me, I know that I know what goes on when people begin to be in meetings. What goes on, it's like you're on a fire. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to represent you as gold or silver. And maybe there's some mixture that is going on with the world. And you're here in this fire and it's burning. And all of a sudden, whatever the mixture is, it's coming out. And when, as it, it is coming to the surface, the mixtures that you've allowed. Not, not, I'm not in any way... Uh, reducing the impact and the radical change of the new birth. I'm, I'm telling you about what you've allowed in your life since the new birth. What you've allowed to come in and the mixture in your heart and your thinking and your life. And so that begins to come to the surface. And, and the way that that is really expressed is intense temptation. Suddenly things are rocking you. Well, that spiritual rocking you because it's being exposed. Before it's just kind of hiding out, hiding out and just sneaking around, you know. And basically expressing itself in things that are not as confrontational. So... That's why you really want to be in long extended meetings. Yes. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm reaching to God where that we can 
actually get back to having a building again so that we can actually do meetings continually. At least, you know, I would, I would really like to have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, night meetings and then be off on Monday and Friday, just like we did this past week. You, you know, we just end meetings every day. And then what's going to happen is you're going to begin to experience breakthroughs. You're going to begin to confront the things in your life that has nothing to do with the reality of God. And if there's people around you that love you and they're going to tell you like it is, they're going to say, you know what, your irritableness is coming out or, you know, you're this or you're that. Stop it right now in the name of Jesus, you foul spirit of hell. Let me help you with this. Plead the blood of Jesus right now because you're getting demonized kind of thing. No, you would have to confront it. You would really have to confront it. Because the reality of it is, is there's mixture in, in so many of God's people's lives. They've never really understood how to live consecrated life. And you got to go start, you get in these meetings, you start saying, Lord, I'm going to live a consecrated life. And Satan's laughing at you going, you mine. And I'll prove it right now. And then blow a trumpet, have all the angels look, so to speak. I'm just going to put this you know, picture together for you and say, I'm telling you right now, this person who's just pledging all these things to God and say they're going to do all these great things in the kingdom, they're mine. Watch what I can make them do right now. And then the Lord allows a certain amount of temptation, a certain amount of adverse circumstances and situations to come along, find out whether you on the rock or whether you on the sand, whether you... You know, it takes an idiot to build their house on the beach. It might be like a cool location for a while. For a very short while. Oh, no, no, no. I'm up above the tide line. Oh, yeah. In the summertime. All right. And we all know, being on the coast, that the, the tide in the summertime does not match the tide in the winter. And it's a terrible thing that we would actually build our lives spiritually. To, you know, you've you got to really work at trying to block out that you're an eternal being. You've got to work at that. To try to eliminate the reality that we live forever. That we're not like the horses and the dogs and the rabbits and the squirrels. And the lizards and, the, and you know, the honeybees and the ants. We are different people. Uh, we not like the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is, is burned up. Our life is forever. Amen. Your life is forever. And some of you may, you know, may be sitting back going, hey, you know what? I'm 20, and I got like at least 60 more years. You don't know that you have 60 years. And even if you did have 60 years, that's a pretty short time. And the reality of it is, God won't be mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. He won't be mocked. He said, oh, I can get away with it. You can get away with nothing. I wouldn't do that because that's actually willful transgression. Don't, don't be saying you get away with anything. I'm going to tell you, those of you who don't, you know, you're basically letting the powers of darkness kick you around. I want to tell you this. It'd be far better for you to keep crying out to God saying, Lord, help me. I want to hate evil. I don't hate it. I love it. It would be far better for you to be hanging on by your fingernails than to just like act like, oh, I can get away with this and ignore God. Don't do that. Because then you literally truly would be living as a fool. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Well, the fool also acts, lives like there is no God or acts like there is no God. In fact, I would say that that's a bigger fool. At least the fool that says there is no God, maybe he's been indoctrinated, you know, through various different intellectual means or whatever, just isolated and by and large from any testimony or witness of God. But the fool that, that has heard about God and has had an experience with God and acts like that they're not going to stand and be judged by him, that's, you can't get any more, you know, absent of any kind of thinking of real consideration for your life. You know, you may not love you, but Father loves you. You may not love you enough to, now let me say this, you love you. But you may not love you enough to live right, but Father loves you because he recognized the darkness and deception. See, the scripture says, if our gospel be hid, it's hid from those who Satan has deceived and put spiritual blindness upon them. And here, hid, hidden from them, the glory of this gospel. And I'm not just talking about the knowledge that Jesus, the eternal God, came to the earth. And, and lived out this life showing all humanity what kind of life, what kind of human being God purposed us to be when he created us in his image and his likeness. And side note, God's going to have that. God's going to have a bunch of human beings living out the same kind of glorious life that Jesus lived throughout eternity. You don't have the option to be a part of that. 
you have the option to be a part of what's called the first resurrection. Are you listening to me? You have the option of being a part of receiving this wonderful glorified life that Jesus himself showed us by example when he was raised up from the dead and his mortal body put on immortality and he received once again the glory that he always had with the Father. That's, this is the living reality, people. And God has invited you into this. And, but, but it's far more than, if you would, just the ideas and the concepts of who Jesus is. It's the reality. The out, this gospel that Satan wants to hide from you is the reality of this extraordinary life. This reality of God's own joy, his own peace, his own love, his own power, his own goodness filling us up so that it, it, there's room for nothing else. Filling us up so that it flows. It's not just leaking out. Are you with me? It's filling us up so that it's flowing out like rivers. It's supernatural. And if you fill something up and it's got, you know, some cracks, it's going to leak. Or if it's overfilled, right, and the top's not on really, really good. And, and that, but that's a stagnant kind of a situation. There's nothing stagnant about this. It's dynamic. It's constantly God flowing into us with his glory and his presence and flowing out of us. It's the river that you see in Ezekiel chapter 47 flowing from the throne room and then flowing out into every part of the world and healing everything that it touches. God wants his river flowing out of the throne room of heaven into our lives. And the only way that we become vessels that are receptive to this river is that we born again. We're made a new creation. This miracle of salvation. That's why the Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came not only on the command of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father, but he, it, to, to, to fill us, to, to baptize us, to empower us, but he came to flow through us to witness to all humanity of this wonderful life in God. He came to flow through us to take care of every situation about our life. To flow to that aching part of your body. God had to make you a new creation. Otherwise, you'd never be able to receive that river that flows. It'd be bypassing you. Coming, just a effulgency of God's glory coming, but it just goes around you. Because you reject Jesus. You reject the miracle that he wants to bring of the new creation. The new creation is the most holy thing, the most wonderful thing, the most sacred thing that God made in all creation. He made it to be just like himself. He made it to be in his image and his likeness when he formed Adam from the fine dust of the earth. But he recreated us and formed us from the very life and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He formed us from the very blood of Jesus. It's just like God formed um, Eve, you know, I hesitate on that because her, her name really is Kava. God formed Eve from the blood of Adam. God formed you and me from the blood of Jesus. Amen. This new creation, the most holy, most wonderful thing. Amen. And Father is really asking us to start thinking different about our life, not to be conformed to this age, to be, but to be transfigured. That transfiguration isn't going to just come because you're reading the Bible. Transfiguration just isn't going to come because you're in the prayer meeting. That transfiguration isn't just going to come because you're showing up to the church service. That transfiguration is going to come because you respond to a, an invitation that's written better than in gold lettering or, or pla palladium lettering. I think that's what the sheiks send out. Is pl they write the, they, they have the your guest card written in pl palladium so that if you just sold your guest card, you could probably get a couple thousand for it, your invitation. Because I, I, I know a person and that specifically, a person, there are folks that I know of, but a person that specifically I know that was invited to one of the Saudi Arabian sheiks parties. And so he got there and it was a, you know, amazing invitation. He could have sold for a couple thousand bucks. And then he gets there and by his, you know, when he, get, when he gets into his room, you know, the gift basket, it has the most expensive Rolex watch that you can buy. And it goes on and on and on. And that's just the average participant. God has invited us into some riches and, and some glory that most people have never even explored. They've just been trapped in religion. Religion is a pathetic thing. 
Why? Because it, inter it runs interference from you ever really knowing these riches of God that Father wants to extend into your life. That he wants to fill you up with this divine power. And this divine authority to know him. To walk with him. To interact with him. Which is the transfiguration. Let me just tell you real quickly about the transfiguration before I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Okay? And so, the transfiguration, you read about it in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. The Lord Jesus said to, to his disciples, some of you, there was just some. You know, and, and it's some not because, you know, well, let me just draw straws. You know, I kind of like you. You know, like we're like kinsmen, you know, we're like soulmates. And none of that stuff going on. Are you with me? They're, they're, they're selected because of their response to God. And their willingness to go with God. And their willingness to mature at that moment. To be what they need to be in order to experience these things God wants them to experience. I'm convinced of it. Why? Because God's no respecter of persons. Amen. He took Peter left Andrew behind. Took James and John the brothers. and Left James the lesser and a whole bunch of other you know, great folks. Philip and the rest behind. So there's some of you that are going to see the kingdom of God come with power. And that are standing here. And, 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 he, and he gives them, you know, kind of, you know, a, in not too many days. And he, and he takes them, what they did, what, they, what he did is he said, guys, you've never been in my prayer room. Do you have a prayer room? Some of you have a prayer room, don't you? It's a place that you go. My wife was raised Catholic. She's got a Catholic prayer room. I, I give her a hard time. I'm not allowed in her prayer room. It's a sacred place to her. It's like I go in there, is this where you're praying? Get out of here. <laughs> you're not allowed in here, okay. <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but you know, she does have her limitations. I, I've got a different kind of prayer room. You have a prayer room? Jesus had a prayer room, so he said, I'm going to take you guys up to my prayer room. And when, he went, when, they, when they got there with them, he starts praying, but he's going to get different results than when they were saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's how, it sounds like a computer, hey? I mean, I hear people, I say, repeat after me. And it's almost robotic. <laughs> Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This isn't Siri responding to a request for the Lord's <laughs> Prayer. It needs to come for deeper when you're responding. It needs to go deeper, you know. Are you with me? And so, that's not what they're hearing, okay? The Lord teaches how to pray. He taught them, and I don't know how they were working it out, but I'm going to tell you right now, he takes them to a place that when he starts praying, the, you talk about atmosphere changing? <laughs> All of a sudden, Father appears along with Moses and Elijah. This is big. Could you imagine having a prayer time like that? I bet you would be like, be, you know, going to bed. I can't wait to get up in the morning. This is going to be big. Yesterday it was Moses and Elijah and the Father. Well, I don't know who's going to be tomorrow, right? I, I love having spirit dreams, uh, dreams of the Holy Spirit, dreams of uh, the things coming from heaven because, you, you, you know, like your anticipation, you know, it's like sequels, okay? You know, what's going to happen tonight? This is going to be, who, who knows? This could be really big. And, you know, you, and you get in that expectation mode, and things really start happening. Well, this is a no, an entirely different realm of expectation. And he's showing them something that they can have in expectation. And he tells them, don't tell anybody. There's some things he said, don't tell anybody till after I'm raised from the dead. You can't, you can't. And I, I really believe a big part of it was no one's going to even begin to be able to relate to this until you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. And you're really not going to be able to understand what took place and then have it be effective in your life until you're baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. This, this really happened. And he was transfigured before them in this, and something far greater than what happened in Moses' life when he was up in the mountain and his face began to, sh to glow with the glory of God when he saw Father. He encountered Father. And, and, you know, Father told him, he said, you cannot see my face. You can't see me. You can't see my glory and live. You, you'll, your eyeballs, I mean, I'm going to add this. Your eyeballs will consume in their sockets. Your body, your physical earthly body does not have the capacity to receive, to, to, to tolerate the radiation of my atmosphere. And I mean, you know, and it's, and it's not radiation in a negative sense. It's radiation in the glory of who he is. He's got a brightness that outshines the sun. Out, out, outshines the sun. How close can you get to the sun? You can't get any closer than you are right now. If you try, it ain't going to work out. Are you listening to me? 
His glory outshines the sun. The suns of the galaxies in their hundreds of thousands and hundreds of millions and hundreds of billions and hundreds of trillions and hundreds of zeptillions all function out of just a little part of his light that he's not even missing. Are you with me? He doesn't, doesn't even, he's not being zapping him of any energy whatsoever. They just all move and live and exist out of him. Whew. And now you want to see me, Moses? Yes, I do. I'm desperate about it. Okay, well, I'm going to let you. You've obeyed me. You've walked me. I'm going to let you. But you can't see me coming at you. It's just too much. You can see me leaving. You see me moving away from you. And I'll cover you as I'm coming near you with my hand. And I'll shout my name over you, which was protection and, and an empowerment. But just looking up, and I don't think he looked up very far. He probably did. Have you ever tried to look up at a bright light? Huh? It doesn't work. How many surfers we got in here? It's offshore wind. And that, that's, that salt water's blowing in your eyes. And now it magnifies what little bit of light you can't even see, eh? You're like, well, I can't even see. It's too bright to see. It gets a little precarious, too, especially when the big sets are coming in, okay? <laughs> I imagine that Moses didn't look up very much. But his face from the experience glowed with the radiance of God for the remainder of his life. So that they had to veil him. The scripture says that they didn't want to look at what, they weren't willing to look into and look at what you and I have right now. And I want to just invite you to come to a place of transfiguration. Because these two words that Paul used are absolutely polar opposites. Conform to the age. To be more specific, conform to the age. Yeah, we've got to go to work. Yeah, we've got to do these various things. We've got to be faithful and, and, and taking care of stuff and tending things. But we're not conformed to the age. And the age is putting pressure on the church now like never before. You know, back 20, 30, even 40 years ago, I said, what's going to happen? You know, because when I came out of that, I'm like, don't you bring any, I don't want to hear any music but heaven. Because it was connected to a demonic world to me. I don't hear that. So I'm people here see Christians like rocking out to this. I'm like, I, I don't want, to me, that is a reminder of a former life and a connection with a demon power. And I don't want anything. I don't want it even anywhere near me. And so should be all to every uh, dimension of sin. But I would say what's going to happen is the world is going to take such a position that is so far away from anything that the church could ever participate with that there's going to be a big enough, big enough gap that the true separation is going to be manifested. And now we see so many preachers and so many churches literally going, well, we're going to allow homosexuals and transvestites. I so love T.D. Jakes getting up and hollering out, said, I don't mind the prostitutes coming to the meeting, but when I look up in the choir and I see prostitutes, this is too much. You have turned the church of the Lord Jesus Christ into a brothel. Did you hear him say it? Yeah. Pretty radical. Come on, TD. Bring it. Because what's happening is that everybody just wants to say, oh, you know, it's because we made it about bigness and counting heads. And bigness qualifies us as being successful. And people run after the fame. You know, it's, it's, we're all going through those same temptations that Jesus went through. You could, Jesus could have justified it. He could have said, wow, you know, he's going to give me the place and position of fame over all the world. Man, could I really use this to influence people uh, for the kingdom of God? You know, and that goes on. It goes on. Oh, you know, all I got to do is turn this, this stone into bread, and then now you're going to know that I'm the Son of God. Wow, you know, the Lord could really use that. People really have their eyes open if I do that. That goes on. There's ways to justify so many of these things. And Jesus made a clear distinction. said, no, I'm not going with your suggestions. No, I'm not going for my own self-interest. No, I'm not going for fame. No, I'm not going for my own pleasure. No, I'm not going for any self-gratification. No, I don't have to prove nothing to you. Are you listening to me? Yes. And, and we're, we're really, we're in, the, we're in the vortex of all of this. And the Lord's screaming out, no, 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 no. I want to call you to a place of worship. I want to call you to a place of presenting your body a living sacrifice. Because that's the same context of Jesus' prayer room. 
People go to a prayer, and I tell you right now, there's more power in a Catholic pulling its bead, or their beads. There's more prayer. There's more power in a New Age person holding onto the crystals and literally, as it were, channeling, you know, demonic energy than a Christian sitting in their prayer room. Are you willing to do that? Because I'm telling you right now, if you are on Mount Carmel and you were basically confronting the prophets of Baal like Elijah was, you would lose. You would lose. And the prophets of Baal are up there screaming and hollering, man, bringing some stuff. They're shaking. Those guys knew how to create things magically. They knew how to create things out of a demonic realm. It's just that the power of God was there, the authority of God was there, and Satan couldn't operate when the power of God's around. Are you listening to me? Yes. It's just true. I've, I've watched this my life. I'm a firsthand. Not only do I see this in the Word of God, I'm a firsthand witness of those who carry the anointing of God and witches and this and that and the other people and, uh, and, and, and various different sorcery and magic. Their magic, their witchcraft, their things will not work around the anointing. It just doesn't work. It's shut down. It's like, well, I don't know what my power. I'm, I've lost my tricks. I'm, my power. I don't know what's going to I got to go somewhere and chant a little bit or whatever. It doesn't work. New age people, their stuff, their magic doesn't work around me. Amen. It's just a challenge, okay? Uh, you know, you sit most of on an airplane. Yeah, you're a new age person. So tell me, uh, you know, tell me about your power, okay? What can you do? Well, I can do this thing. I can do that thing. Try to do it now. <laughs> can I see? Are you going after it? Huh, I don't know. I don't know. It's not working yet. <laughs> and I don't have to plead the blood, say in the name of Jesus, nothing. I got the power of God right here with me, man. Why? I present myself a, a living sacrifice, totally acceptable to God. It's just various different dimensions. Jesus always walking around in the fullness of the anointing. With power to cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead. But now he's going to go into a communion. And that communion with the Father is going to be a transfiguration. It's going to be a transfiguration. He's transfigured. Suddenly, his natural human body takes on the glory of eternity. So I said, oh, we, God knows in this natural earthly body, we can't do this and can't do that. Jesus said, we can do this. We can do that. And then ultimately, he says to us in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, in this same posture of prayer, in the same posture of worship, in the same posture of presenting ourselves to the Lord and interact with them. He says, don't be conformed to the age, but be transfigured by thinking different about yourself or the renewing of your mind. Because see, now what's happened is God made you something that has nothing to do with the world or with the age. Through the new creation, he took you from being a human being to being a person of the Spirit. Jesus said so, John 3, 3. Somebody said, oh, I just believe that's false doctrine. I never heard anybody say that. Well, how about Jesus saying it? And I just repeat it and bring it into a place or a context where it has a practical right now reality in your life. Is that okay? Yes. Oh, my, many people think that's false doctrine. As soon as I bring the scripture into a practical reality of your life, oh, that's got to be false doctrine because I, the Lord doesn't expect this. Listen, it isn't like some kind of laborious sacrifice or some kind of a heavy burden. God's given you an opportunity. Open up the doors. Come on into glory. Would you like to be happy? Come on in. Huh? Would you like to have the best food, the best clothing, the best this, the best that? Come on in. And how much does it cost? It's free. Really? Yes, come on in. I paid in full for you to have it. I love this story. I'm just going to stop and tell this. You can remind me if I forget where I'm at. Okay. I'm going to tell the story because it's a great story where, you know, a, a, a guy that is a minister from a poor country and uh, this is a true story. And, and he was invited to come to a conference. And a person paid for him to come, paid his hotel, paid his airfare. He gets to the conference. And every day he passes by this huge buffet in the breakfast, for lunch, and for supper. And he thought you had to pay. So every day he walks by this breakfast. And people said, have you eaten? Oh, I'm fasting. He's fasting. Because he didn't have any finance. He didn't have any money. And so he's not partaking of anything, breakfast, lunch, supper, just every time. It's just the aroma just drive you mad, okay? Just great stuff in a very nice hotel. At the end of it all, um, at the end of the conference, somebody said, Let, let's go eat. He says, no, you know, I've been fasting. Oh, well, just come and have some tea and then go sit down with them. And he suddenly then in the whole, you know, questioning and things that was going on, discovers that 
the, that the breakfast, lunch, and supper was part of the package that was paid for him. What a terrible moment in his life because he was fasting by force. He was telling people that he was fasting because he didn't want anybody to feel sorry for him and pay for his food. But look at all that he missed out on. He deprived himself. And people are depriving themselves all the time because they don't think that's part of the package. I tell you, transfiguration is part of the package. And, and, and the reality of it is, folks, if we're not experiencing these things in God that he has for us, the world is going to be very enticing. Look, at they're having so much fun over there. They're doing the same. They're, they're, they're buffeting their body with pleasure. I'm going to buffet my body with some pleasure, too. No, the Lord says, no, 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 wait a minute. I want you to look at the world entirely different. I want you to have a different kind of thinking about yourself. And there's two things about, really, truly, I want you to understand there's two very important dimensions or parts to this transfiguration that God wants us to experience. A supernatural encounter, uh, these supernatural encounters with them. And one of them is that you're, that you're dedicated to not be conformed to this age. To not, to not love what these, uh, the, the, this age loves. To not do what this age does. To not agree with what this age demands. And that you are willing to think different about yourself according to what God said. He says you are not a human being or flesh anymore. you spirit. Jesus said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Paul comes along in Romans chapter 4. Uh, forgive me, Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 4 through 10, or really verse 4 through 9, and he really emphasizes this, and he breaks it down of what it means not to be of the flesh, but to be of the Spirit, and underscores it and says, you are not of the flesh, but you are of the Spirit. He opens up the whole conversation, really, uh, uh, the whole message uh, uh, to declare to us the miracle provision, miracle power, miracle entrance that if we agree with it we get to participate with it if we don't agree with it if we modify it if we make it something different than it is we'll never have it he says there is therefore now no condemnation i so see so many of god's people that live in condemnation and shame and don't feel worthy and deserving you're never gonna be worthy and deserving so get over that part anyways you know the bottom line of it is there's just too much pride and arrogance that our that we've taught our kids yeah. if understanding the community of the haradim and the ultra orthodox and even the hasidim you live in a practice of not developing arrogance and pride. You live in a practice of developing in every way that they can out of a human realm, humility and lowliness. But we don't do that. We all end up basically busting heads and kicking butt. Are you with me? No, we do. That's all of our athletic programs. And, and you know, and, and, <laughs> and every concept of what, you know, is going on. You're big and bad and feel good about yourself because you're into this stuff. Are you with me? We, gotta, we need help. We need help. This isn't going is to work in, our, in the concept of transfiguration. And, and the Lord has given us this nature to automatically obey him out by nature. But think about it. How many of God's people live in condemnation because they've not been willing to agree with God? If, therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. If you've got condemnation, by, by definition, you're not in Christ Jesus. We're, I'm not going to push it that far. I'm just going to tell you that's not supposed to be in your life. And somehow you're not in Christ Jesus to have it because being hid away in him is the ultimate of surrender. Say, okay, Lord, I'm in you. I, I, there's none of this I've deserved. I'm just yours. I'm in. I'm in. And, and you've got me covered in every way. And you're teaching me obedience. And you're teaching me to do things right and walk in your way. Why am I not in? Why don't I have to be in condemnation? Because I'm not in the flesh anymore. I'm not depending on my own human ability and walking under the condemnation of a death sentence or a judgment upon my head because of Adam's sin. I'm not walking that because I'm not in condemnation because I'm in Christ Jesus. And I'm not walking anymore or living anymore or thinking anymore. And it begins with how you think. After the flesh. After a state of being, a human existence, a race, a, nas a nationality, a human existence more than anything else. I'm, I'm over here and I bought in on the reality that I've been redeemed. I bought in on the reality that I've been made a new creation. Fully to where that... This is, this is thinking different. This is being renewed in the spirit of mind. In other words, on the basis of what God has done for you and what God has said, this is how you should live and think about yourself. 
You not, should not think of yourself as a person just in the earth. You should think of yourself as a, a person in heaven. You shouldn't think anymore on the basis of sin. You should think on the basis of righteousness. And the, this goes through, that God goes through what it means to think different or to be renewed in the, in the way that you, that you view things. It's a renew, it's, it's a, put it this way. Another way to translate this verse of scripture is to say, you have an entirely new perspective of the world around you. And the perspective that you have of the world around you is those things that God has said about you. It's a perspective of who God is and what he intended us to be, that now he's ransomed and redeemed us so we can be it. But you're going to have all these things in this age saying, you not that, shut up. Get up here, let me slap you. Are you with me? <laughs> it's just true. It's true. Some of you weren't raised in a bunch of, around a bunch of older people knocking you, flipping you in the back of the head all the time. Knocking, it's like, shut up. <laughs> so some of us were abused as, as, as young kids. <laughs> Get up here, shut up. You can't do nothing. <laughs> but I mean, I never had any problem with it. I don't have any problem with it today. So if I'm a little bit rude to you, forgive me. I mean, I, I just, I really, I'm, I, I'm not very sensitive. I just really not bothered by much. And, and so sometimes I'm not as, as, as sensitive as I ought to be to your sensitivity. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you, if you find yourself good away in Jesus, you're not going to be sensitive anymore. Oh, you're not going to be that way anymore. And I would have gotten, I got smashed for showing any kind of whimpering. Are you with me? You guys, I'm going to tell you, if you weren't raised in a good Holy Ghost culture, it'd be better to be raised in a culture that keeps you from being a whiner. Are you with me? <laughs> Let's go for the Holy Ghost culture. Let's go. Let's step over into this life of Jesus. Let's be empowered by him to where we don't have insecurity. Insecurity is a terrible thing. That's what makes you so sensitive. You're so insecure. Quit being. Don't be like that. Let God make you so secure because now you're totally accepted in the beloved. You are totally in. He made room for you at the table and said, here, come sit right beside me. This amazing God did that for you. He didn't just do it for me. He did it for everyone. God is no respecter of persons on any level in judgment of wrongdoing or in his judgment of now being made holy and acceptable and beloved. God will do anything you ask. What happens if you start believing that? Some things are going to start getting good around you. Are you with me? And, and this is a place of being renewed in the way that you think. The perspective of life that you see. I, I have a heavenly existence now, not an earthly existence. I stand before the Father. I'm not just basically standing before men. I'm, I want, I'm living out God's approval of me. I'm not trying to pursue men's approval of me. I'm living out God's past tense approval of me. My approval is in Jesus. Not my approval is not in anything that I've done or anything that I, have, that I can do. My approval is in what Jesus has done and what Jesus do, is doing. And in that, I find my life being transfigured as I also have interactions, divine interactions with them that can be, there is no limitation on this. God seated us with this. It could be on that same scale. If it couldn't be, he would have never seated us with nor James and Peter, James, and John with this kind of fellowship and communion and then commanded us twice in the epistles to have it. Because what happens is you read in your Bible, you say, oh, my Bible says that it's transformed. No, it's transfigured. And I promise you, even under peer review, one of the greatest theologians in the Anglican uh, community, uh, who is Henry Alford, agrees totally with me that this should be translated transfigured, both in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and also in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It shouldn't be changed there. It should be transfigured. It shouldn't be transformed. It should be transfigured on the basis of the word that is only a, 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 a word, a Greek word from metamorpho, the root metamorpho, that is only used exactly in the same way three times times in the New Testament and it shouldn't there's no reason to change it because the president set priority of what does this mean it means to be there worshiping praying and suddenly you begin to glow with the glory of God and then people there is a place I want you to understand this is a place of intimate hookup with the Lord I've watched people's faces glow with the glory of God in meetings where the anointing was so strong and they've been in meetings and they're living consecrated lives and they have this flow of the Holy Ghost it's not because you're sweet and religious and pull your Protestant beads and do your Protestant genuflex. And I'm going to say Pentecostal beads and Pentecostal genuflex. For me, it's no different. I can look at the Catholics doing it and say, oh, yeah, I recognize that. 
Because there's, diff there's a different form of it among Pentecostals and, and Protestants. It's a different form. It's not the reality of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that is supernatural. God wants us to be supernatural. Amen. He wants us to be of the Holy Ghost. You want to be supernatural. Amen. huh? I've never watched a Harry Potter movie, but I'd venture to say many of, it, of God's people, and maybe many in this place, have. Because why? You've got a longing for the supernatural. There's a longing for the supernatural. You like to see the supernatural. You like to see the stuff work. It's fascinating. There's a, it's on the inside of you. Why? Because you create an image and likeness of God. And everything he does is supernatural. Amen. Amen. It's way beyond anything that men can do. Hallelujah. I love it. I practice it. Man, if I got one of those, you know, they, what do they call them? You know, they call you know, those little, those little twisters, wind twisters, they call them. They got a name for them, right? What is it called? Huh? Dust devil. Just by the virtue of the name, that thing ain't coming near me. That's it, dust devil. By the virtue of that name, I'm God. You get away from me now. You're not dusting me with your dust, devil. <laughs> no, it's true. I practice it. My, my boys, my families watch me do it. Most of the time, I'm successful. I send it away. So I said, ooh, that's weird. Okay, well, listen, I'm telling you right now, God wants you raising the dead. How weird is that? Huh? God wants you to have everything you ask in a supernatural realm. He wants you to say to the blind, blind eyes see. Somebody said, well, that's true. Let's, I want to watch that. Well, the Lord doesn't perform magic tricks. <laughs> Ask Herod. Oh, you know, we've been wanting to see you. We've heard so much about you. Would you do like America for us? And everybody's sitting around and basically drinking the booze and doing whatever else with their uh, arm around somebody who's not their wife. No, I'm not doing no tricks for you. No miracles in this place. Are you with me? It isn't about that. Are you, can you get this? Are you getting this? It is about a sacred realm that God begins to bring you and I into these invitations, rather giving us an invitation to, and that we begin to respond to. And in that realm, all these things that only God can do of his life and of his goodness begin to take place. Amen. And we walk away, we walk away with that empowered. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So only, oh, I get it, I get it. Some people think that only the witch doctors and the sorcerers and the new age is supposed to have power. You and I are supposed to sit here with our hands folded and no. look pious. No. <laughs> no. And then what the Lord said, you should be endued with power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come yeah. upon you. He told us to go preach the gospel of the kingdom, raise the dead. And no, no sorcerer, witch doctor, new age person can raise the dead. They might be able to stop the, the ringing in your ears. <laughs> or help you with a fungus on your toes, but they ain't raising nobody from the dead. Are you listening to me? Uh, thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'm going to read some scriptures to you. I love that you're here. I hope you love being here. I, I love that you're here. I, you know, I was talk the Lord's talked to me many times, said, would you just preach if only Ann showed up? Yes, Lord. Would you be faithful to me if you just had two people sitting in a meeting and, all, and both, only one of them liked you? <laughs> that would be Ann. <laughs> she thinks I'm sweet when I'm grumpy. You, know, you don't have a lot of people like that in your, in your, in your world. <laughs> would you be faithful to me? Yes, Father. So I'm really blessed that I get more than two here today. And I really believe that the most of you actually like me. Yeah. <laughs> You're not sitting there going begrudging us. Why are we even here? I hate this. Every time we come, I leave feeling terrible. Who wants to go someplace to, to, to feel terrible? And I, and I pray that that's certainly not the case for any of you. Because there's times that I'll, I'll, I'll minister things by the Holy Spirit that's really supposed to work in your life. A brokenness and a repentance, and if you harden yourself against it, you're going to leave feeling terrible. <laughs> you are. I know what's going to happen. You're going to leave feeling terrible. You just break before the Lord and say, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry I want to get this right. Then you'll leave feeling great. It's an altar call. It's an altar call consciousness. I mean, I, 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 I came into it. I've lived it. I've modeled it. I've taught it about how that you can come to a place in prayer to where you're confused about things, you're carrying a burden, you're carrying 
and uncertainty, but you can get into a place of just crying out to God and just seeing Him. You're not even talking to Him about the problem. You're just saying, Lord, I want to know You. I want to walk with You. I want to serve You. I want to be the person that You want me to be. And you just get captivated in this love talk between you and the Father. And then all that stuff that you were carrying, all that stuff you were burning, it's just not even there anymore. And now you've got clarity of thinking. Did you know if you wasn't stressed out when you were taking a test, you'd be a lot smarter? It, it is, stress and worry makes you so stupid. You can't remember nothing. <laughs> it's true. If you can relax, I mean, you can do some stuff. You know, right? You're shooting the hoops, right? You're just like, just swooshing it every time. You get now to practice, or, you know, you're hoping and basically to, to, to make first string, and now you can't make a basket to save your life, right? You, are you with me? Yeah, you're with me. Shake your head. Yes, tennis, whatever it is that you do. Because you, you just get all nervous. Here's your tennis racket. <laughs> if you could just relax. If you could just rest. Amen. If you could just be comfortable here. Come on. If you can just let God begin to take over. And it becomes about what he's done for you. And who he is towards you. That he's here to supply all your needs. To protect you. To keep you. To do everything beyond all that you could think or ask. You can, it, you just, I'm, it's all released. And now you can think clear and you know what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. You know the choices that you're supposed to make and the choices you have to say no to. And I'm going to tell you right now, we're, we walk through a phase in our walk with the Lord and, and, and it to where that we really want something that God says we can't have. And we say no to it because he said we can't have it, but we really want to do it. We really want it. The temptation comes that we really want to do it. But reality of it is, even in that situation, it's not in your heart. It's not in your heart. It's just that you're overwhelmed with the powers of darkness and the influences of the world around you. Because as soon as you commit that act of sin or transgression or whatever it is, you're overwhelmed with shame. How did I do that? That was a terrible thing to do. All of a sudden you think you, now you're no longer mental. You actually have clarity or thought and you look at all of the consequences of what you've done. You couldn't, you weren't even able to think clearly before because you were caught up in the whirlwind of deception and lies and confusion. Oh, come to the altar. Amen. Come to the altar. Amen. Come to this place of prayer. Come to this place, oh God, help me. Come to this place of clarity of thinking, of rest. Come to this place of servitude of where we take our yo His yoke upon us and it's first and foremost servitude to the Father. Father, I'm going to serve you. I'm not going to take, make my own choices. I'm not going to live my own life. I'm not going to do my own thing. I'm simply going to obey you. It gets pretty ch that gets pretty challenging at times, doesn't it? Here, it's not so challenging. You're like, yes, that's what I'm doing. Because there's strength here. There's the atmosphere, the atmosphere of heaven. All the influences of darkness aren't going on here. Well, you've got to be able to take this with you. And this gets stronger. What we're doing right here, right now, it gets stronger. And you want it to be stronger. Yes. You want those interactions with the divine. You want to be overwhelmed with this joy. Because now you've got a contrast there before you. When now you're strongly being tempted to conform to the age. To become fleshly, as it were. To give yourself over to demonic influences. To leave off being, presenting your body. And, and people, this is very, very important. This is very important. These words are extremely, extremely essential to understand. It doesn't say present your spirit a living sacrifice. It doesn't say present your, your soul or your being, your living being a living sacrifice. It says present your body because this world and this earth existence defines things for our body and will define them on purely an animalistic basis. It truly will. It will, come, it will define them on the basis of, of, you know, reproduction of things essential for a natural life. And the Lord says, wait a minute, that's not who you are now. You are heavenly being filled with my glory and of my spirit reigning right now in this life with me. A vessel of honor that I can fill with all of my power and manifest who I am through you. Wait a minute, God, what? 
You want to manifest who you are through me? Yeah, that's why, you, that's why you've been called out of darkness into this marvelous light. So that you can show forth what kind of a person that I am. I want to endue you with my glory and my fire and my presence. Because when God starts talking about, I want to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. That has to bring us back to the fire cloud of his glory that was on the tabernacle. That he immersed or baptized the tabernacle in. This is who I want you to be. I want you to be that witness of who I am in the earth. And this is how God set it up. And what's going on is their trial is going on of whether or not we truly want to reign with him throughout ever. For, throughout, throughout forever. Forever and forever. He's just asking a question. What kind of world, he's asking you the question, what kind of world would you create if I gave you the power to create one? Would everybody just be doing adultery and fornication and murder and this and hatred and everybody hate one another? Be talking about, you create a world and everybody's talking bad about each other in your world that you create. What a t disaster. You create a world and everybody gets divorced in your world. You create, what world would you create? And the Lord has given to us the privilege to agree with him in the world that he created. Amen. And it's beautiful. And I say, Lord, I'm going to be a part of the world you created, even though I'm here in this world. I'm not of this world, even as you're not of the world. And that is a radical statement. If I made that, you'd say you are completely, you've taken leave of all reality and sense. No, Jesus said it. In John chapter 17, verse 16, he said, you are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. He wants us to think different about ourselves. He wants us to have a different perspective. He wants us to see that we are in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is in us. That we are a new creation. That we not of that descendancy of Adam anymore. That we are the descendancy of the almighty God. He's our father. That we not what was once bound by sin and death. But we are a new creation. And everything's brand new. So I said, oh, you know, we just laying aside the way to sin. And, you know, it's just process. Boy, it's a real slow process, ain't it? <clears throat> it's just this progressive thing going on. No, there ain't nothing, there's nothing slow or progressive about if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things are new. And all things are of God. Amen. Amen. Just, there's nothing progressive about now. You look in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, what do you look for? Someone else's face? No. You look for your face. You look in the mirror, and what do you behold about you? The glory. And seeing the glory, because you have a different perspective of who you are, because of what you believe and agree with God on what he said you are, what happens? Then you're changed from glory to glory. In other words, you are transfigured. Because you agree with God. In agreeing with God, everything that you agree with God in, there is a certain degree of transfiguration and encounter with God. When you've had a great experience or a move of God, one of those transfiguration moments, or you would, if you would, one of those encounter moments, because I kind of use those, those are synonymous. Jesus wasn't leaving the old, going into the new when he was transfigured. It was an encounter, so don't redefine it. People want to redefine it, so they use transformed and they make it incremental. Are you with me? Yes. Don't do that. That would be a myth. That's why words are so profoundly important. Yes. That's why understanding words and the presidents, not in Attic Greek or even in Koine Greek, but understanding the way, understanding them the way that the Lord defined them by how he used them in the context in which he used them. So is this, is this, these are encounters. Those encounters, if I started talking about some of the encounters right now that I've had in God, I would almost go right back to that. I'd be overwhelmed by that. You want those encounters. God has those for you. But as long as you're feeling like a, sh you know, a shameful, low, you know, worse than the worst kind of, you know, ragged old sinner. You with me? I just barely got one toe in the kingdom of God and wondering if that was even allowed. Or whatever it is that you think about yourself. Quit thinking about yourself according to the way that you think about yourself. God is asking you to come and have the mind of Christ. The mind of the Spirit. And start thinking about yourself the way that He thinks about you. Amen. You know, this. if you want to understand Psalms, for example, you've got to understand the first Psalm. Because all Psalms are based upon the first Psalm. God did it correctly. And He said, blessed is the man. Huh? Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Because the counsel, what somebody says to you, it's going to dominate your thoughts. You're going to think about that. Well, so-and-so said, so-and-so said that if I speak in tongues, that it would be a devil from India. 
Because those Hindus are over there going, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to tell you right now, when those Hindus, listen, anybody who says that, if you know anybody who says that, I want you to tell them, I want to take them, and I'll pay for their ticket, and I'll, uh, if they're a preacher or an influential person, I'll pay all their accommodations. I will take them to India so they can see the manifestation that they're talking about. Because when that manifestation goes on, it, the place is filled with fear and terror, and demon spirits are doing crazy things. They're, nothing, they're lying through their teeth. It's nothing to do with some blah, 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 blah that's going on in a Hindu witch doctor ceremony. Are you listening to me? Liars. You better be careful. You'll blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. But somebody told Joe, you've got to be watching out there. Now that thought rules over you. You better watch it because the way you think is the way that you're going to start moving. Huh? Huh? You start thinking about something, you know. It's like a, a, a woman of God was saying, she said, she was sitting there in a, in a, in a, in a meeting. It was a, 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 a conference and they were all sitting at the table listening to a speaker and you know, and she's looking over there at that chocolate gooey brownie. She said, I can't have that chocolate gooey brownie. And then she's like, Lord, why is this chocolate gooey brownie just so pulling on me? And the Lord spoke, to, spoke, why did this have to be so big to me? This is ridiculous. What's wrong with me? And the Lord simply said to her, quit looking at it. <laughs> Wisdom. Quit looking at. She's like captivated. Hold on. <laughs> Watch out. Don't look at it too long. Because the longer you look at it, the bit, the harder it is to say no to it. The harder it is to resist it. I gotta have it. Gotta have it. Gotta have it. No, I can't. No, I can't. No, I can't. Gotta have it. Gotta have it. Listen. Don't stop looking. Because the way that you think, if you think about it too long, you won't reach out and you're taking a bite of that, <laughs> that, that chocolate gooey. <laughs> that chocolate gooey brownie. And this is not an advertisement for the salt and, st and salt and straw. Because that stuff is good. <laughs> the way you think, you think about it too long, you're going to do it. Blessed is man and does not walk in the counsel of the godly, nor stand in the way of sinners, because that's what you're going to do. You think about it, ultimately you're going to do it. You're going to, you're going to have to fight the battle right there. You're going to break that thing down right there. you say, no, in Jesus' name. No matter what it takes, you bust through the thing. Huh? Huh? Because you recognize you've got a different perspective. You're not that person anymore. You're not of a human realm. You're not of a fleshly realm. You're not just living out your life for those kinds of things. You're reigning with God right now. You're reigning with Him. You're going to judge angels one day. God's filled you with His holiness, His sacredness, His righteousness, His purity. He's filled you with His glory, His power, His purpose, greatness for you now and also throughout the ages to come. Yes. We can't even begin to imagine how amazing. You know, the earth right now is under a curse. So it doesn't, it's as beautiful as it is, it can't produce what God ordained it to produce. The colors are not as brilliant. The leaves of the trees are not as radiant. The sun and the light that it's produced doesn't have the same kind of glory that he's intended. But one day that's going to be removed. It's going to be beautiful. I mean, I, I look at it like this, that everything is living and it's going to fully express its life. From the water to the air, everything is living. The clouds, everything is living. We got this mechanistic mind. Oh, we got, we define how the clouds are formed and, and distillation. And all. No, you don't get it. You really don't get it. Father wants us to. He wants us to have a different perspective of life. But if you're conformed to this age and if you're going with what everybody else says, I promise you, you're never going to see for what it really is. If you're going to go with all the things that people are going to say about you and that you're going to say about yourself and that Satan is going to, you know, say about you because he's going to draw you into sin and then like he's going to rub your face in it and he's going to shame you for it and he's going to accuse you over it and you have no right. I know who God is. This is his attitude. I know who God is that is sacred and his holiness and you don't come close, man. You mine. Kicks us in the ribs and tells us to lay there in it. 
I hope you can see Satan that way. That way because you get some fighting mad stuff going on. And then get yourself, I ain't having this. I'm going to slap you or whatever, you know. <laughs> However it works in your spirit. No more devil. I mean, I'm, at a, I'm, in, I'm engaged against this wickedness. And I recognize this is, when I'm tempted, when these things are coming at me, I recognize that, that these aren't things that are within the framework of my heart and my, truly my interest, that it's a demonic deception and power of darkness. It's an imposing of the spirit of this age upon me. And Father's given me something far greater than the spirit of age. And he's given you something far greater than the spirit of this age because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. We have an overcoming power. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> we get to choose the right. We get to choose the good. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, mighty God. You know, I was, I was in the throes of this one day. I'm just, some of you have heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again. I was in the throes of this one day, and it was an intense situation. It was intense. It was almost like, you know, can't think of anything else. It was just, it was crazy. Just the intensity of temptation, the insanity of the persuasion of the powers of darkness. And I just stood up and I said, I'm not trading in my riches for some stinking empty paper bag. The Lord just come give me some sanity in the moment of the great stress, eh? I'm not giving up my garments for some moth-eaten rag. Have you ever seen the ransoms? I tell you this, I to see. White royal garments paid for and made at Calvary. I my mean, father's already put a, a, a crown upon my head. Why should I take it off? Huh? He's already given me this place of royalty and majesty in Christ Jesus. Why should I go and become a beggar full of shame? Who is me? I hope you can get a different perspective of who you are. I hope you get a different, what a transfiguration when suddenly Peter, James, and John get to see this Jesus that they've been hanging out with, sleeping, you know, beside, you know, every night, going from town to town, village to village, campfire to campfire. And now they see that old dirty clothes radiating with the brightness of eternity. Huh? And because of the tradition, there was always a washed face, so I'm not going to say unwashed face. Because it had washed hand, washed face, and washed feet. And then that his face began to shine with the brightness of the ages. You're never going to forget that. And then to see that same glory on you. You talk about a makeover, people. You talk about beauty. Mm -mm -mm -mm. You talk about looking at a world, not at a tombstone over your grave. I've already picked out the spot, and I've got my place where they're going to put me in the ground. I know where it is, and got a spot picked out for Ann. She's right beside me. Anybody wants to join, you know, there's... <laughs> Nobody's going to know. I won't know. <laughs> but I don't see a tombstone in the grave. That's this place you're going to hide me away because nobody wants me sitting out here <laughs> waiting for the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> Put me underneath the ground as a proper place for me and you. Amen. Amen. As we wait for the resurrection of the dead. I don't see a, a plot of ground in the tombstone, although I picked out a spot that has a great view. Even though I won't know anything about it still, you know, just. I see the holies of holies, the throne room and almighty God with a smile on his face because of the way that I lived for him. The way that I overcame. So that I can, I can get to the point where I say, I don't have to just say, Lord, lead me not into temptation. I'm saying, Father, try me and prove me. And find in me that I fear you, that I love you. And that, yeah, I'm walking in your wisdom and your insights. I'm just going to go through this real quickly and tell you all the verses. Well, some of the verses of Scripture that I've quoted to you.
or referenced, but without telling you to turn to them. Verses of Scripture like uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 16, 1 John 5, 19, Romans 8, 5 through 9, 1 Peter 1, 14, Philippians 3, 20 through 21, Ephesians 6, 17 and 23. And there's several of these that I just really, really like to point out to you real quickly. And, and Galatians 1, 4 being one of them, Galatians 1, 4 says, who gave himself for our sins. He became the ransom. He gave his life a ransom for me. Isn't that beautiful? How he loved us. He's my kinsman and redeemer. Oh, how he loves me. I pray that you can sit around and say that, oh, how he loves me. In all my sin and all my failure and all my wrongdoing, oh, how he loves me. He washed me. He cleansed me. And now I'm going to serve him because I love him. He poured his love in me. I'm learning how to love him. You know that? You learn how to love him. When you say no to sin, you're learning how to love him. Isn't it amazing? You say, oh, I want to love him more. Is it, is it that you have the, within you the power to love him more. Did you know that through a choice? You can obey him more. Yes. And in obeying him more, you're empowered to obey him more. Yes. The Lord continues to strengthen us by his spirit and in our inner being. <laughs> Who gave himself our sin that he might deliver us from this present evil age. No problem not conforming to the age I've been delivered from. <laughs> but I've got to perceive myself there. I've got to see myself in this realm of being in Christ, of being in heaven, of seated together with Him, of being filled with the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Ghost is here. He's here on this earth. Jesus in heaven. God, the Holy Ghost is here. And He's looking for people who will be willing to allow Him to anoint them. I know so many different ones who as young men went out into the woods and the desert and fasted and prayed and cried out to God for days on end and rolling around in the dirt. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. The pleas of the Holy Spirit through them. Take all of me. I don't want to be for anything other than you. I don't want to go to a secular job. I don't want to do secular things. I want to live out the kingdom like Elijah lived it. I want to live out the kingdom like David lived it. I want to live out the kingdom like Jesus lived it. I want to live out the kingdom like Paul lived it. I'm not interested in any other kind of life. And the Lord heard them. You know, I look back and I, I've told people, you know, if I'd had it to do it all over again, I'd just go to Bible school. I'd, I'd go to a place where I'd find a place where everybody was hungry for God as much as I possibly could, where there was both the Word of God on the most excellent level being taught and the Spirit of God moving, if I could do it all over again, just because I'd want to show, Father, that all my interests are in Him. But even though I didn't, still, He's made it as though it were. He has. I may, have, I may be lifting, li losing out on some of the anointings that I could have had, some areas where I could have been used more, but Father, make that up for us too. It just how, how will we now respond now and surrender all ourselves to him? Amen. So I'm going to say thanks for you and all of your failures and faults and, and problems and wrong decisions and try to do everything I can help you do. To, to do, try to do everything I can to help you understand that it's not over. It's just a new beginning if you want it. But I'm also going to say it in a radical way so that those who haven't made their choices yet won't make wrong choices. You better be careful how you hear because I'll come radical because I want, I want Ezekiel and Shiloh to make right choices. I'm going to emphasize things for their little ears that if you don't listen to right, you basically can be overwhelmed with guilt and, and regret and you shouldn't have that kind of response. You need to recognize there's a lot more people in here than just you. Are you with me? I know that's something that's hard. It's hard. We come into this world thinking it just began. Everything just began. And I'm the ruler of it. And don't tell me it's not because it's expressed in every area of life. I raise animals. I watch how they behave. Those little calves, they act like they own everything. It just started. Shut up. Get out of my way. 
I'm going to kick you. Little horses. It's the truth. Is there's that arrogance, you know, that untamed, I'm in charge. They go over and they kick their mom. It's true. Grab a hold of her and start getting their food. They work her over. It's true. Moms, I hope you feel better. But I'm, I just, I hope you can, I hope you can understand what I'm trying to tell you. I, I know I bring things in there and human behavior and human psychology and things that probably I should just leave out because it just is a distraction and people don't understand it. But I really want you to despise your life in this world. And that's why I say it that way. I want you to like look at your life in this room and go, eek. Amen. And like, wow. <laughs> I could have been a contender. No, you couldn't have. Quit lying to yourself. <laughs> I could have been famous. Not a chance. I got, a, I got a text this morning from Jason and KC, and they said, forget about the low-hanging low fruit in Kashmir. It's fallen to the ground. God is doing so many things. So many people are saying, yeah. They want, they want Bibles. They want Jesus. We want laborers. Right now, what's going on in Kashmir is I've given Jason and KC the most urgent of assignments, that they fall, find a big enough, big enough property to where that we can have everybody on the same property, that we can have a house, at least one house for the family, and then a house for, you know, a place for uh, the women's dorm, and a place for the men's dorm, because we need, we need laborers. They're earnest. They, 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 they can't get it all done. There's so much to do. There's so many people that are so receptive. And we're just going to see that happen. And I just want you to, I want you to say, I want you to say, Father, I'm living a dream. Thank you so much for Kashmir okay, and what you're doing in Kashmir. A people that says, a people, because I, I really believe that the Lord will advance this thing. And I'm not going to look past, I'd like to see things happen in a bigger way in 2023 in terms of an outdoor meeting and, and a, a, a crusade, an indoor crusade, but not past 2024, because I'm already lining up people that are going to go with me. I've got the building all picked out. It's a beautiful auditorium, and we're just going to, we're going to see the Lord fill the place up. Amen. And it's going to be one week of meetings, morning meetings evening meetings Amen. hallelujah I'm going to see many people come to the kingdom we're going to see church started Amen. and uh, this is all going to happen and we're going to see a nation taken for Jesus yes. Amen. hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. I want to read one more verse of scripture to you then I'm going to let you go till 4 o'clock and come back and let's we'll press in deeper ha, ha. oh God you know, I can, sometimes I feel the longings that Father has of the things that he wants to do in this nation, but especially here, right in, here in San Diego, but then especially in you. And not God knows. He was tempted in every way in which we were tempted. God placed within a man's heart a desire to have a wife. Jesus, was, Jesus went through that. He always chose the kingdom. He always saw something that was far more glorious and far more perfect and more importantly the will of the father whose will is absolutely superior to all of our wills whose insight and plans for our life our own plans and our own insight could never begin to match never never we've got to trust him people he's got some plans here Paul says it talks about this continual growth and maturation, this continual, as it were, development in divine insight of an interaction with God in, in different ways. But one of the ways that he, that, he, that he expresses it is here in 2 Corinthians 4.15 when he says, though my outward men per perish. And we know that's happening. It was hard to understand my outward man perishing when I was 22 years old. That's why you look in the mirror, you don't see any changes. My outward man perishes. Now I can see my outward man is perishing. I'm melting. <laughs> but my inward man is renewed day by day. 
go, I'm going from glory to glory because I look into the mirror. I see the glory of God. And in seeing the glory of God, I don't see me. I see what Jesus said I, he's done for me. What Father says I am. I see that. I refuse to see anything else about me. Because Satan wants to give me the image of this age. And I say, no, I'm not going to have that. I'm not wearing that mask. I'm not wearing that image. I'm not having that place. I'm not being that person. And I see the glory. I see who Jesus is, what he's done for me, who he's made me to be as a new creation. And I'm changed. I'm transfigured. See, when I think about it, when I agree with it, when I consider it, when I give myself over, there's a transfiguration going on. Amen. When I'll think and agree with the way he thinks and what he's saying, there's a transfiguration going on that takes me to something even bigger in terms of encounters. There's an encounter. When I say transfiguration, say encounter. Amen. Transfiguration. Amen. Transfiguration. Amen. Live for them. Pray for them. Hunger for them. Desire them. Jesus said, if you obey me, I'll come and reveal myself to you. That's good. There's no greater encounter than that. Ephesians has so much to say on this maturation and these encounters, but I'm just going to keep it. Ephesians 5.17, in contrast, Ephesians 5.17 and 523. And not 517. 417. I thought I wrote it down. Ephesians 417. The scripture tells us, I tell you therefore, and I, I testify in the Lord. I'm telling you who you are. I'm telling you on behalf of what God has to say. That you, from now on, do not live your life or walk after a life that's like other, the nations or the Gentiles or the people who do not know God that are around you. Who only walk in the vanity, the senseless, meaningless thoughts of their mind. But you, this is what you need to do. You put on the new man. You put on this new creation. You put on this very life and image of Christ Jesus that God has commanded you to be conformed to by this transfiguration. Amen. Amen. You put on Christ Jesus who's created, who's created you after righteousness and true holiness. You be in putting this new man on, this new image, this new person, this new creation. You be renewed in the way that you think. You be renewed Huh? What a transfiguration. Amen. To see yourself once as what you were and to see yourself now as who Jesus is. Amen. What a transfiguration. Amen. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Amen. The way that you think about yourself, the way you perceive yourself, and the way you perceive the world around you. Everybody stand with me, please. Mom de no now, I'm going to tell you something. I don't care what you feel, what's going on. The Word of God is power to transform you. Rather, power to change you. Hallelujah. Power to make you everything that He's purposed you to be. His Word is miraculous. His Word works. If you disagree with His Word, you'll find within His Word the miracle that framed the worlds, that framed the universe, will be working mightily in you. There she David said, concerning the word of God, your word have I hid in my heart. In other words, I've made it inaccessible to anything else. Nothing can find it. But your word I've hid in my heart so that I will not sin against you. Huh. The power of the word. We've received the engrafted word of God which is able to save our soul. His word is working mightily <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed is the name of the Lord my God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. If you're willing 
God is willing. You're standing here right now. If you do not know that you're right with God, it's today and time to get right with God. If you're watching by web, you're not right with God. There's only one way to get right with God, and that's by the power of the name of His only begotten Son, the only means by which God has made a way for men to be made holy and acceptable unto Him. It's the means by which God, who alone is holy, could impart holiness into a person who is very unholy. It's the only means by which God, who alone gives righteousness, could impart righteousness into a person who's unrighteous. It's the only means by which God can give His power, His Spirit, to those who have an unholy spirit, the spirit of this world. And now, and by giving us His Spirit, have the ability to say no to sin and yes to God, to no longer be deceived by the things that are around you and only live for those things which are here, here in the here and now, but live for the glory of His majesty now and throughout the ages to come. If you want to get right with God, God wants you to get right with Him. If you're willing to come to him, I promise you, he will not refuse you. And it's time to get right. I don't care. What, well, listen, what you're going to do is going to drag your feet through. Somebody say, well, it's just too much for you. I'm going to give up. What, what are you going to give up for? Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? There's no place to go. But run into the arms of the one who hates you. And I'm going to tell you right now, you can either take my word for it or you can learn on your own. On your own. Satan hates you, and he's going to prove it to you that he hates you. God loves you, and he'll prove to you that he loves you. But I promise you, Satan hates you, and everything he's setting you up for right now is to prove to you how much he hates you, hates you. and I promise you, that is one devastated, messed up, ruined life. You ruined it. So you can either take God's word for it, the testimony of the hundreds of millions. Huh. Or you can just learn the hard way and go ruin yourself. Because the amazing God's amazing love is that if you make it, if you exist through the ruination and through the interaction with demon spirits, if you come out on the other end alive, if you have a moment of sanity, can call upon the name of Jesus, God in His mercy will love you, restore you. But there's no guarantees that you turn your back on God and walk in a demonic realm that you're going to live through it. Any more that there's any guarantees that if you go through the tribulation, you'd come out on the other end of life. There's too many hazards. There's too many crazy events. And God himself knows. And he judges and he decides how much a high-handed rebellion has been levied against him or not. How much is just deception and ignorance and how much of it just rebellion and stubbornness? He makes a decision. Not you, not me, not the people around you that love you or hate you. God makes a decision. And his decisions are just. There have been many people who've turned their back on God that didn't come through it alive. They died in a sin. And in hell they lifted up their eyes being in torment. And I pray that everybody can understand that so that you'll have a greater burden to pray for your loved ones, for your family, for your friends, for the people that you know. Because these things are real. They're more real than they ever been as real and in many respects more real than you are just standing here or that I am. God loves you. He's proven that love. Jesus Christ gave up his life and offered his life as a ransom for you, for me, for anyone who serve will. So right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I break the strongholds of darkness. You lying spirit of hell. You have no power, no right to levy your deception against those who would be saved, who would walk with God, who would know the ways of truth and ways of life. Father, we pray that those here today who've given their life over to you, those that you've changed by miracle of salvation, would begin to walk fully with you and for you. And no matter what, 
that they would love not their life unto the death. In Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Lord, do what only you can do in this place. Father, we ask you in your mercy. Come, reach into the heart and the lives of every person that's here. I want you to understand something. Satan has a pervasive, a, 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 a persuasive way of convincing you who he believes you are. Listen to me. Satan has a pervasive, a persuasive way of convincing you who he thinks you are. And he has the support of the majority of society and the culture which he himself has influenced, if not created. He persuades people that they're homosexuals. He persuades people that they are brilliant. He persuades people that they're nothing. He persuades people that they're the conqueror of the world. He persuades people that they're alcoholics or they're drug addicts, that they're this or they're that. It's a lie from hell. And then he's got society come around and say, no, that's who you are. It's all genetic. What a lie. Can you please show me the genome, sir? No, but we'll find it one day. And everything about life proves that they're wrong. If homosexuality was genetic, it would have already deleted itself. Because a man can't have a baby and a woman can't have a baby by a woman. It would have deleted itself. Lord, help us. Hate to even say that in mixed company, but my goodness, it's gotten so bad now. Those things are... People, do not give your children iPhones, iPads. They don't need them. Don't give it to them. The iniquitous, of, the iniquitous thing of this world, the demonic realm of this world, are actually targeting kindergarten ages to get them addicted to pornography at a very young age so they can make money off of them for the rest of their lives. It's their marketing plan. Don't do it. They don't need a computer. Until they understand that Satan is determined to destroy their soul in hell. Till they come understand that they've got to learn how to hate evil and have the ability in Christ Jesus to stand up against it. It's gotten to the point, people, they're just, come on, the compromise has got to end. Girls, you that are pouring yourself into, pouring yourself into pants like somehow it was, you've turned liquid. And then solidified when you're in it. Stop that now. If there's ever a time there's going to be a transition of modest apparel. God said modest apparel. If you're poured into your pants or your dress is so tight that we, it defines your physiology, that's not modest and decent apparel. Stop it now. The, the, the allowing yourself to be influenced by the spirit of this age will keep you from the transfiguration. It needs to be practical. Somebody said, oh, no, here he goes. He's old-fashioned preaching from the clothesline again. We don't even have clotheslines anymore. I'm having to be preaching from the dryer. It, it, it's amazing how much Father loves us and He wants to convince us of His love in every way He possibly can. And He wants to be more persuasive on revealing to you, describing to you, and making known to you, who, to you who you really are. What you really are. That's so beautiful. Oh, how beautiful. 
Would you put up that, would you put up the first verse of that song real quick? Just, because if I don't see it, I'm just going to say it in a different way, and I want to say it in, No. 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 In the beauty of your son, you loved and made me. In the glory of your grace, you brought and gave me. This eternal life is not life eternal. This eternal life is so rich. It's Almighty God, the glory of the majesty of Almighty God looking at you going, hey, I created you in my image and my likeness. And here, all that I got, it's yours. Let's have some fun. Let me show you what real fun is. Let me show you what real joy is, what real delight, what real entertainment is. Come on. Let me bless you. Let me prosper you. Let me give you a good life, a long life with no sorrows. Let me do it. Let me love you freely. Yes, sir. That's just, yes. Transfiguration. Thank you. Who said that? Would you wave your hand? Thank you so much. I should have known it was you. Hallelujah. Transfiguration. We live in I'm going to dismiss you, but anyone who wants me to pray with them, or for them, I want you to come and pray with you and for you. God will touch you. He'll meet your need. He, he just wants you to believe that he's there and he loves you. And in that, he's going to do everything for you. So simple. Worship the Lord with your giving because I'm going to tell you right now, God's going to set himself on doing some serious multiplication on your behalf. God has set himself on making you rich and adding no sorrow with it. Hallelujah. Amen. We love all of you. Bless you, Jesus. You want prayer for anything? Come. Pain in your body. Pain in your soul. You need to get right with God. You're not sure if you're right with God or not. If you're not sure if you're right with God, why should you leave here not sure? If you came in here hurting and wondering and torment, then why leave like that when all the answer is here this whole time? So you just come, whatever your need may be. I know God's faithful to meet your need as you present yourself to Him. And those that you're watching online, He touches you right now. God in His mercy will extend it even over the airwaves. Quiso Ramande over the cell towers. Hallelujah. Caramande reste rebea touched. Jesus name he touches you now hallelujah
your lives. The fire of the ghost. The fire of the ghost. In English. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, thank you for the anointing of the Spirit of the Lord. Bande, Kurosoto, Irisalem, and Emeradite. In Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you that you give us the ability to receive all the things that you've sent down from heaven. <laughs> that you brought to us by your Holy Spirit. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Blessed is the name of the Lord our God, King of eternity, who has given to us his Holy Spirit. Blessed is the name of the Lord, <laughs> the King of eternity, who has given to us the blood of his only begotten Son. Blessed is the name of the Lord our God, who has given to us this wonderful life. This abundant life. This. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. The King of eternity. Who has given to us the gifts of healing. And the gifts of the Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God. King of eternity. Who has given to us the gift of salvation. The gift of repentance. Now in Jesus name. Costa. Father, we thank you that you made all so simple. If we call upon your name, that you'll come with your glory and your majesty and you'll bring forth the beauty of a new creation. Jesus. Jesus. I want everybody in here to say with me, say, Jesus. Jesus. I recognize, I recognize that you are the almighty God. You are the Savior of the world. It's your kingdom that will last forever. And that you have invited me in to your kingdom. That you made it possible that if I just call upon your name, in truth, in truth and, in and in sincerity that you will wash me that you will cleanse, cleanse me from all of my sins, of my sins. and so Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus right, now, right now I thank you, I thank you that you wash me, that you wash me and that you cleanse me, that you me from my sins I confess, I confess that you are the Lord, that you are God, that you are my Savior, and that you will make me a new creation right now. And you fill me with your Spirit so that I can know you, serve you, walk with you now and throughout all eternity to come. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, mighty God. Now, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, let God baptize you in his Holy Ghost and fire. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this spake he of the Holy Ghost. He said, if anybody's thirsty, and you come up here right now because you're thirsty. God put thirst on the inside of you. He said, if anybody thirst, come to me and I'll give you the drink. And that's what he's doing right now. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Holy Ghost. Now, right now, in the name of Jesus, all the former things, all those things that belong to this world, all the torments, all the harassment, all the pain goes from you right now in Jesus' name. And right now, this is the beginning of, your, of a brand new life in every way. Everything is new. Everything old is gone and has passed away. 
His peace comes to you, peace that passes understanding. His love comes to fill you. Alleluia. His joy, His glory. Father, I ask you right now in Jesus' name, take this life, baptize her in your Holy Ghost and fire right now in Jesus' name. Fill her with your spirit. Just like you did on the day of Pentecost. Like you did when all of a sudden there came a sound of a rushing mighty wind and clothed in tongues of fire came rest upon everybody that was in the room. And they all began to speak with this heavenly language, this language of the Spirit. As you, Holy Spirit, gave them utterance. Now I ask you, Lord, give this life utterance. Rabade arstorade astokaremete in list in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name God he gives us the power to renounce all sin and all the former things and all the ways that we've lived and say no more are you going to be in my life Lord I'm going to learn to walk with you choose your ways and do those things that pleases you by your spirit by the divine power that you give me right now. Now in Jesus' name. Right now, Jesus. It's like he puts a wedding ring on you. It's true. And he starts your life up. And this is the beginning of what it means to live. Thank you, Jesus. You just begin to thank him for his love. Thank Father, thank, thank the Father for Jesus. Thank the Father for the Holy Spirit comes and invades your life and makes all things new. The Lord says, Behold, I make all things new. In Jesus' name. Out of your bed flows rivers of the Holy Ghost. Say, Kush, they time, they goes right out of your belly flows rivers of the Holy Ghost. According to the promise of God, these things are yours. They go to Sombra de la Santa. Mandola de Mamakesh de Papon. Jesus, thank you for your precious blood, Lord Jesus, that washes and cleanses and makes new. The Lord says, we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins cleanse us from all unrighteousness he's amazing God is amazing isn't he and then if we just go ahead and get clean with God then the, the flow of the Holy Ghost just comes right to us there's no hindrance we go repent where we need to repent make things right where we need to make things right we just move right on in the realms of glory now in Jesus now in Jesus name now in Jesus name we'll see you back here in a couple hours 4 o'clock